and he spent his later years battling cocaine addiction, obesity, alcohol dependency, paternal lawsuits, and allegations of links with the Camorra Crime Syndicate. Uh oh! Gotta get your cocaine from somewhere though, don't you? This video is brought to you by Surfshark. Yes! Hello, Blaze Legends, and welcome back to another episode of Brain Blaze. It's been a while. I mean, for you, it's probably been like, why well, there was a video yesterday, Simon, what are you talking about? It's been since yesterday. For me, it's been like a week and a half. Because uh, I was off, I had a cold, my wife had a kid, you know, two big life events. All in one little space of time. The cold is relevant. <laughs> Honestly, my throat's feeling a little bit rough, so maybe we're not going to be shouting like crazy today. Let's see! It was at this moment that he knew. He fucked up. <coughs> oh god. It's not COVID, don't worry. It's just tuberculosis. Oh god. It's, it's not tuberculosis. <laughs> that started off as a joke and then it became real. Uh, just to make me feel better, Danny has deemed or Danes or whatever the correct word is that we shall uh, do a video about sports because as everyone knows, I f***ing love sports. I don't. Uh, I've actually been watching a TV show called Ted Lasso, and uh, I was like, I'm not going to enjoy this. It's about football, the most boring of all the balls. Ha! <laughs> Gay! And uh, I love the shit out of it. It's extremely good, and you should see it. Unfortunately, this video is not brought to you by Apple TV. But uh, look, Apple TV, if you want to uh, <laughs> kick a few bucks my way, I'll keep talking about your brilliant shows, like For All Mankind and The Morning Show. Genuinely really good stuff. I haven't seen any of your fantasy drivel, because it's drivel. <coughs> there was one on there and it was like Norseman of the Norse and I'm like, oh, for f sake. No. Or maybe that was Netflix. That sounds like more like Netflix, doesn't it? It's a shame that TV hadn't been invented to cover the marathon hells at the St. Louis Olympic Games of 1904. A strong contender for the most ill-considered, most ill-prepared and downright farcical sporting event in history. I'm sure this marathon contested at the very first Olympic Games to be hosted in America would be fascinating to watch back today with enhancement of video replays and insightful expert commentary. I mean, I, I was just saying how football is the most boring of the balls, but I think Olympics is the most boring of the sports because it's like, yeah, we all the boring sports and we made them all equally important. And I'm like, look, you know, I understand why football is one of the biggest and like uh, whatever Americans play because lots of people watch it. It's kind of, I understand why it's enjoyable. I understand why people get into it. Like curling though. I really, uh, 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 uh. <coughs> The event would have been a daunting challenge for even the most experienced runner, as it was held under scorching conditions over a hilly, unpaved course across the Missouri Plains, which frequently kicked up clouds of dust into the air and made it quite tricky for the athletes to even breathe. Nah, you're running a marathon, you don't need to breathe, athletes. That's for babies. On top of that, the organizers thought it might be fun just to include a single water stop, a roadside well, for a marathon which covered just under 25 miles or 40 kilometers of dusty, baking hot terrain. Yeah, who needs water? This is gonna be a disaster. Lots of people are gonna like die or something like that. It's like, well done Olympics. The participants didn't seem very well prepared. Either postman, oh my God, Anderin Karavajal, maybe had been forced to hitchhike to the event after blowing all of his money in New Orleans and turned up in street clothes, which he cut around the legs to make it look as if he was wearing his real shorts. I don't trust something like that. Open that button. The Olympics back in the day was way more chill. Like, when it, I, I don't know like what Olympics number this was. I don't think we mentioned it. But it's like people just were like, yeah, and there was like people climbing greasy poles and shit. Like today Olympics are like, oh my God, it's really intense. I, and I mean, I know I don't watch it. I don't think I've ever watched it. People are like, how do you know you won't like it, Simon? And I'm like, it's just a feeling. <laughs> it's just a feeling. <laughs> that wasn't quite as bad as Felix Caravajal. Wait, is this group? It's got the, he's got the same surname. Uh, from Cuba, who turned up to the event in long trousers, a posh white shirt, and a pair of walking shoes. That sounds like me. They'd be like, yes, hello, chaps. <laughs> I'm here for the marathon. It's like, Simon, did you not get changed after work? You'd be like, nah, I thought I'd just, you know, take it easy. How hard could it be? I don't trust something like that. Open that button. Although not many photographs exist from the event, I wouldn't be too surprised if one of the other runners had turned up puffing on a pipe while wearing a smoking jacket and a pair of slippers. And everyone would comment, what an absolute f***ing legend. Especially if he won. Even if he lost, legend. If he then won, turbo legend. It's like the guy who beat the women at tennis. It's like the most sexist, it's not sexist, it's just... A, uh, it demonstrates the differences in athletics between men and women. Athletics, like sports, like in tennis. Where there was some guy, and I can't remember, I, it was, maybe it was one of the, the Venus, uh, the, the Williams sisters, 
said like, yeah, I could beat a man at tennis. And some guy who's like the top 200th player in the world or something was like, you're on. And he beat her handedly. And I think he was drunk or something. And it's like, yeah, that's why men and women play different, they, they, they have separate tournaments. <laughs> Simon, you sexist! That story I've completely butchered, but it's something like that, and it's really wild. I think it was called The Battle of the Sexes or something like that. Maybe I even made a video about it. Sounds like something I would do. Make a video, that is. Have been known for it. Of the 32 entrants, only 14 managed to make it to the finishing line, as the others succumbed to blistering heat, dehydration, or various other illnesses and mishaps. <laughs> One guy got tuberculosis, like Simon. William Garcia from California swallowed so much dust that he suffered a stomach hemorrhage, which very nearly killed him. Holy I was kind of joking, but this guy almost actually died. Leo Tuyane from South Africa was one of the first two black Africans to ever complete the Olympic Games, and he had a, and he had been a strong favorite to win the event. He may have fared slightly better if he hadn't been chased over a mile off course by a pack of rabid wild dogs. Holy sh**, what is up, America? Why aren't you, I, is that, I, I guess it's 1904, but maybe you should have taken care of the rabid dogs on the Olympics. It'd be like, yeah, we make fun of like Rio, Whenever that Rio Olympics was, and it was like, oh my god, this is not going to go well. Look at all this shit that is just not prepared, and there's lots of crime. And in 1904, it was like, did, you take care did someone take care of the rabid dogs and the dust? To be like, no, no, no. There's rabid dogs and dust. It just adds to the challenge. Like, Rio could have just, they could have just leaned into it and be like, yeah, 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 green swimming pools. It's uh, just the vibe we're going for. We love algae. It represents, like, our uh, climate change. Right, Greta? Sam, cue the meme. No. Meanwhile, the postman, Andy Caravel, had become a little peckish as he hadn't had a chance to eat anything over the course of his hitchhiking adventure, so he stopped at an orchard to have a quick bite on a few refreshing apples. Unfortunately, the apples were rotten to the core and gave Andrew in terrible stomach cramps. Wait, who's eating an apple? Apple's one of those, it's not like meat where it's been cooked and it doesn't smell anymore and you're like, mm, this is delicious. And then the next day you're like eating your open and then if you're eating an apple and it's rotten, you know. You're like, oh, this apple is clearly rotten, and you throw it away. What's this guy up to? Also, I've, I, I, I like did some long distance running in the past, and uh, yeah, that time of year where the apples are out, you're just like, bosh, mm, great time. Sometimes I'll be so thirsty, I just suck, on, suck all the juice out of a bite of apple and just spit the rest out. It's very classy behavior. <laughs> and also stealing, I mean, allegedly. I mean, no, it's definitely stealing. Allegedly, I did all of the former. FBI, open up! He eventually decided to just lie down on the roadside and take a long nap until the pain subsided. Quite incredibly, he still managed to come fourth. The gold medal was awarded to a New Yorker by the name of Fred Laws, and this was a big deal as the Lewis Olympics was the first of only three Olympic Games to hand out real gold medals, not that cheap silver shit that started getting dished out when everyone realized that gold actually pretty expensive. What? <laughs> Having said that, Fred Laws never got the chance to bite into the gold. He'd already posed for a photograph with Alice Roosevelt, daughter of the reigning president, and was getting ready for the presentation ceremony when someone in the crowd pointed out that Fred didn't really deserve the medal. And this was because Fred had become a little tired after the first nine miles, or 14.5 kilometers, so he cheekily hopped into his manager's car for the next 11 miles, or 17.7 kilometers, before jumping back on his feet and the, before jumping back onto his feet for the final stretch and getting hailed as the winner. Wow. It's really easy to cheat in the Olympics in the past. Nowadays, they're like, yeah, 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 we got a blood transfusion with blood with more platelets from some dude who's got turbo platelets. I have no idea if that's how it actually works. I'm pretty sure it's red blood cells, not platelets, that are actually the ones that people want. Wasn't that Lance Armstrong's thing? I mean, I know he had a lot of things. He cheated multiple times, right, and then got cancer. Right? That's Lance Armstrong, the bicycle dude. Allegedly. And this was because Fred had become a little... What was I talking about? Oh yeah, cheating was easier in the past. It was like, <laughs> these days, <laughs> how do you do it? Well, we do the platelet blood thing. Oh, in the past, we just put a motor on the bike, didn't we? <laughs> Easy. He was obviously disqualified from the event and even received a lifetime ban, although this was lifted after a year, as it was decided he had not purposefully intended to defraud. <laughs> Mate, he took, he, what? <laughs> Fred's disqualification meant the gold medal went to English-born American Thomas Hicks, although his own race was also quite extraordinary. God save the Queen. Thomas would never have been declared the winner under today's stricter rules. At various points throughout the course, he was helped, he was helped along and carried by his trainers while also regularly receiving doses of brandy and strychnine. Isn't strychnine a poison? I feel like strychnine was the poison that all the bad guys were using in, in the 1990s in the movies. 
possibly in real life. Who knows? When he was finally carried over the finish line by his handlers, Thomas had begun to experience hallucinations and belie believed that he still had another 20 miles to go. His legs were still moving backward and forward in the air as if he was pedaling an invisible bicycle. Holy Olympics of the past. I mean, it sounds like a whole lot more fun. Today it's like, yes, congratulations to the gold medal winner, blah, 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 blah. Blah 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 There's no one like hallucinating to get their riding a bicycle baby and carried by some dude. Olympics of the past sounds awesome. The past was not the worst. I mean, it was for this guy. This guy's got all sorts of up problems. This kind of madcap marathon could surely only have happened in the olden days. You'd never catch someone cheating their way to first place by, say, 1980. Or maybe you would. Yeah, you would, but it would become a lot more complicated, like with the platelets and <laughs> The red blood cells, I mean. 76 years after the wacky races of the 1904 Olympics, the Cuban-American Rosie Ruiz, 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 grabs first place in the female category in the 1980 Boston Marathon under slightly controversial circumstances. Rosie's time of just over two and a half hours was originally considered to be a record breaker for a female athlete, but there was so, but there were several noses twitching in suspicion after she crossed the line. For starters, Rosie hadn't even broken out into a sweat. She looked perfectly calm and composed, as if she'd just nipped down to the shops for a bottle of Lucozade. Maybe that's exactly what she'd done. Although this is America, so to nip down to the shops for a bottle of Lucozade feels like possibly the most Amer uh, British statement ever. What would the Americans say? Popping out, no, that's so British. Heading out, maybe, that sounds more American. Heading out to the grocery store for a bottle of Gatorade. Boom! Told you he was Top Gun. I've never seen acting that good. Then there was also the small matter of nobody. What do Americans call corner shops? Like a 7-Eleven? A convenience store. Bingo. So convenient. It is convenient. I don't know why I said it sarcastically. It's super convenient. I mean, they sell all sorts of shit. They sell soda. Like, uh, by me, I, I know Americans think that just means it in the can. Soda in British English means like soda stream, you know, from the machine that you press the button. What the are we talking about whistleboy why are you telling a story about soda no one gives a f get on with the video christ sam's gonna cue that new meme which hurts my feelings where there's the dude sitting on the steps and he's like what the fuck is this guy talking about i'm like oh man ah oh, that means i haven't made sense and sam doesn't get it and it's like neither do i to be honest i'm like what was i talking about on that day sam no you know what it doesn't matter because it was going downhill straight from there there was also the small matter of nobody recalling seeing her at any point during the first 25 miles of the 26-mile marathon. It turns out that after registering for the race, Rosie had simply disappeared into the crowds and then taken the fastest shortcut to the finish line, discreetly re-emerging on the track when there was only about half a mile to go. It gets worse, though. She didn't even deserve a spot in the Boston Marathon in the first place. She had qualified for the event by coming 24th at the earlier New York Marathon, but it was later revealed that she'd taken a subway ride for most of the course. <laughs> Surely they track, I feel like, I mean, I know there's a lot of runners and stuff. I guess they can't track them all, because there's so many. I mean, they could now just like whack a GPS chip on them. Or I mean, since like the COVID shots have been rolling out, we can use the 5G chip that's been inserted by Bill Gates to track all the marathon runners. It's another super convenient thing about having the 5G chip upgrade, right? I mean, I, I, I really feel like lately I've had much better reception on my phone. The government's really been tracking me a lot better than before, which is really nice, to be honest. It makes me feel safe and secure knowing that the, the big brother's looking out for me. All of the former was sarcastic. Please get vaccinated. So that was a fucking lie. It, and it gets even worse. <laughs> How? She shouldn't have been allowed to participate in the qualifying New York Marathon either. Rosie had submitted her application after the deadline had expired, but then managed to get special dispensation by pretending that she had a fatal brain tumor. <laughs> the doctors are like, yeah, yeah, what you need to do? Go run a marathon. Sure, that's brilliant for people with brain tumors. <laughs> or what? Unlike Fred Laws, Rosie kept hold of her winning medal for eight days until she was ordered to give it back by after being disqualified for cheating. Two years later, she spent a week in jail and received five years probation after being found guilty of stealing $60,000 from the real estate company at which she was employed. Wait, she just got a fine for stealing money? So she, I'm assuming she paid the fine with the money or some like that. Probation is where you don't have to go to jail. So you defrauded your employer of $60,000 and you didn't go to prison for like even a weekend? What the f Rosie. And you've also got this terrible history of being a piece of shit. Didn't they take that into consideration? I feel like that should be taken into consideration. It's like this person stole all this money. Have they, you know, was this a one-time thing where they needed to pay for their mother's brain tumor? Or have they been a consistent piece of shit throughout their life? And they'll find out that she was a consistent piece of shit throughout her life and they'll be like, look Rosie, you gotta spend at least a week in jail. I mean, come on, maybe we can do one-on-one -on -one off. 
The following year, Rosie was sentenced to another three years of probation after selling two kilos of cocaine to an undercover cop. Wait, maybe pro probation? I, I mean, I must be getting it mixed up with something else. Maybe I'm getting it mixed up with turbo prison because you don't get, you don't, you have to go to prison if you sell three, two kilograms of cocaine to an undercover cop. I mean, that's a lot of cocaine. I mean, not for some people, but you know, objectively it is. What? But she always denied that she ever cheated the Boston Marathon right up until the day she died in 2019, notably not from a fatal brain tumor. I'm sure that most sports are built on a foundation of integrity and pride and are dominated by athletes who achieve fame and glory by putting in the hard work and training. But not everyone has got time for that shit. And I'm equally sure most sports also include one or two rotten apples, which we'd immediately know were rotten after we'd bitten into them, as we've previously established. Who can't quite be bothered to run the full distance, so they take a few illegal shortcuts to the winner's podium and end up achieving immortality as one of the many fa faces of bad sportsmanship. Plaster punch. Yeah, I officially think that actually was the introduction. New record, Danny. Well done. We're gonna have words later. Sam always puts, whenever I do this in the video, Sam always puts it like I'm looking out for hitmen or being abducted by aliens. What I'm looking for is there's a little red light on the camera that is hidden behind the teleprompter, which I don't actually use for brain blaze, obviously. And I just wanna check like every 20 minutes or so that it's still recording. Because uh, sometimes the camera, you know, the, the te technology's temperamental. Sometimes it'll just kick off and it'll be like, whoa, mother just blazed for an hour and all that has gone. Ah, no. People say that time heals all wounds. Boxer. Billy Plaster Punch. Did I say the title? The subtitle? Boxer Billy Collins Jr. was about to get a proper pummeling during a 1983 fight against Louis Restro at Madison Square Garden. Hailing from Tennessee, Billy Collins Jr. was a light middleweight and welterweight boxer. What the is welterweight, who had so far managed to get through 14 matches undefeated. His opponent, Louis Restra, had grown up in the Bronx and as a youngster had once spent six months in a rehabilitation center after elbowing his maths teacher in the face. Holy shit, my dude. Sometimes you think like, oh my god, some shit went down at school, and then it's like, and then you hear about like, shit that went down at other people's schools, you a teacher got elbowed in the face by a guy who's now a boxer. It's like, oh my god. <laughs> That never happened. The welterweight had managed to win 20 of his 29 professional matches so far, but was considered an underdog to Billy Collins Jr. Well, of course he was, because the other guy had won 14 undefeated. However, viewers of ABC's wide world of sports were to witness a surprising result as Luis Restro scored a convincing victory over 10 rounds, and Billy Collins Jr. was bashed up pretty bad by the end of it. His face was throbbing, pulse his face was a throbbing, pulsating mess of deep cut, severe swelling, mighty lumps, and hideous bruises. Thanks, Danny. That's the picture I wanted in my mind. A dude with a super f face. Like, boxing is definitely a sport that I don't really have any desire to watch. It's like MMA. Why would I want to watch people beat the f out of each other? It's like people who used to watch that... What was that f horrible thing back in the day? I'd, was this even real? I feel like this was real. It was called, like, bum wars or homeless thing wars or something. And it was like, just... So dudes would, like, pay homeless people to beat the sh out of each other. And I was like... Why would you watch this? It's just fucking horrible. And it's like, I mean, that's worse, because then you're just exploiting the out of people for money. Wait, wait, that's exactly what boxing is as well. <laughs> but I'm just like, I don't get it. Like, why would I want to see this? I don't want to see someone get their face mashed in. It's like, it's not nice, is it? And with boxing, you're like, yeah, and it's causing them long-term damage to their brains, and they're, they're gonna be all f***ed up in a few years because obviously getting punched in the face over and over again, not good for you, is it? What the f*** are you talking about? At one point during the match, the poor guy had complained to his father and trainer, it feels like I'm getting hit with a rock. Oh my God, did he put rocks in his gloves? That's sick. Like, not sick, like, that's sick, brah. Like, that's sick. Like, you f***ed up piece of shit. They, th this guy, I feel like he should have to fight a rock. He should have to fight the rock and the rock gets to replace his hands with rocks. Big brain. That's why I get paid the big bucks. Stop it. Get some help. Following a unanimous decision from the judges, Billy's father had gone over to Louis Restro to give him the customary congratulatory handshake. As his hand sunk into Restro's gloves, he noticed something quite peculiar. In his own words, all I felt were knuckles and fingers. 
There was no padding at all. He immediately demanded that the gloves be impounded by the New York State Boxing Commission until an investigation had been carried out, and the results were shocking. It was discovered that Luis Restro's manager, Carlos Panama Luis, had arranged about half of the padding to be discreetly removed from the glove via, a ti via tiny holes cut into the lining, meaning that the whole match broadcast on ABC was effectively an illegal assault. But it wasn't until 29 years later that the apparent victor, Luis Restro, finally admitted that he'd been aware of this strategy and revealed another killer blow. The tapes on his hands had also been illegally dipped in plaster of Paris, which meant that Restro had effectively been beating Billy Collins Jr. around the head with a plaster cast and very little padding for the entire duration of the 10 brutal rounds. I mean, how the f is no one checking the f out? And does that guy get. I guess it's like 29 years later, so like that, uh, the, the limitations, statute of limitations has passed on that. But at the time, that guy should have gone to like. You should be arrested for that sh that's just straight up assault. Tragically, this was to be Billy Collins Jr.'s last fight. After suffering a torn iris and permanent blurred vision from the illegal beating, he was forced to withdraw from boxing and sank into a depression. Holy f you ruined this mother life. This is so sad. This started off like that's a piece of what a dickhead. And it's like, yeah, and he ruined this guy's career. Sh dude. F you, asshole. Just a year later, he died at the age of 22 when his car spun off a dirt track and smashed into a culvert, in which many believe to be an act of suicide. Okay, so the guy who beat him to death with his, the rock gloves wasn't responsible for his death, but uh, he, had a, he had a bit of a play in it, didn't he? Because he's an absolute douchebag, allegedly. His opponent was found guilty of assault or conspiracy and served two and a half years in prison. Fucking yes! Before resuming a quiet and modest life as a cornerman while living. What the f cornerman? While living in the basement of his old gym. I f hope he died f miserable, and two and a half years is not enough. In that case, that is not enough. Meanwhile, although crooked manager Carlos Panama Lewis was sentenced to six years in prison, he seems to have come out the better of the three. He was banned for life from the professional side of the sport and could no longer work in the corners, but he still privately trained fighters at a gym in Florida right up until his death in 2020 at the age of 74. He could regularly be seen proudly showing off his expensive tacky gold bling while maintaining his innocence over the whole affair and the life that he wrecked over the course of ten beastly rounds of one-sided brutality. He got six years in prison, though. I mean, that's pretty f satisfying, isn't it? I mean, that makes me feel good inside that that guy spent a little under, what, 10% of his life? A little under of his life in prison? It's a good one. I like that. The other guy should have spent six years in there too. That would seem more fair to me. Ah, but before we get into the rest of today's video, I've interrupted it to tell you about the glory of today's sponsor, Surfshark VPN. Yes! Surfshark is what? It's a VPN. You knew that. I just said it. What is a VPN? Well, a VPN to me is, uh, I, I realize there are talking points that I should probably get to, but a VPN for me is basically a way to watch more movies that I'm not supposed to watch. You know, my American Netflix. Boom! And uh, to stop people hacking shit when I'm in Starbucks or the airport. I don't know about you, but I'm one of those people that's like, don't connect. Like, and, and by one of those people, I mean this should be everyone. Don't go like connected to those dodgy Wi-Fi networks that are open. Like, free airport Wi-Fi. Can you imagine how easy it would be? And I don't know if this is easy. I'm assuming it's going to take some hacking skills and all of that stuff. But to just go into an airport, set up a free Wi-Fi called free airport Wi-Fi, and everyone's going to be connected to that. And you're going to be like, what's up, everyone? I'm hacking your right now. I'm hacking your mainframes. And by mainframes, I mean iPhones. But use a VPN like Surfshark and you're all good. And that's why everybody loves Surfshark. Honestly, it's probably mostly the movies, but also no one likes to have their money stolen. So it's like, I mean, great, you can use all that money you've saved on buying Netflix and then getting more Netflix. It's just a win-win. Also, Surfshark is mega affordable. I'll tell you what price you can get it for, or what the deal is today, after I've actually talked about some of the things that I'm supposed to talk about rather than just ranting about my own stories. Although, I honestly think, isn't ranting about the own stories better? My own stories better? Isn't that, I feel like, I don't know, it just feels more genuine than being like, that's not what's on the talking points, but there's uh, something called hack lock. Oh, okay, that's like a thing that uh, keeps your information safe online. So if your password is leaked somewhere, which is totally a thing, it's like, how, why? Because, <laughs> like, I don't know, you've signed up with like the same password for dozens of shit, like everybody does, because of course you do. Well, Surfshark will be like, yo, 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 you might want to change some of those passwords, boy. Uh, oh, I already talked about the VPN, Netflix, and movies, and all of that stuff. You get tons more stuff. Even if you're in America and you just hop on over to Europe, like you can't get all the Jack Reacher, not Jack Reacher, uh, other Tom Cruise movie, Mission Impossible movies. 
they weren't on American Netflix. They are on my local Netflix. What? Brilliant. So don't think that because you're in America, you don't need it. You can get all sorts of other So I'm saying you can get all like manga sh go over to Japan. I've got no interest in any of that, so I've never tried it. But maybe it's possible. I guess so. Who knows? Ah, so what is their deal? Get 83% off and three months of free through the link in the description below. Or use my code BLAZE. Yes, 83% off and three months for free. That's 17% on. It's very cheap. Three months for free through the link in the description below. Or use the code BLAZE. And now, let me pass you back over to today's video. The hand of God. I know that people living in North America, Finland and Venezuela don't really care about soccer. Those are three very different countries just all pulled out of the air. But the 1986 World Cup held in Mexico City was the host of the most controversial goal ever to be scored in the long history of the game. The question is, was it cheating? The answer in my book is yes, of course it was bloody cheating. <laughs> I get the feeling this is one of those things where it's like, yeah, yeah, it was, wasn't it? <laughs> Let's do it! Argentina won the title that year in a team led by soccer icon Diego Maradona. And in, I feel like I've heard of Maradona. Maradona? I feel like I'm even saying it right. I have no idea what he did. I have no idea he was Argentinian. Argentinian? Argentinian? No idea anything about him. An incredibly gifted footballer with a larger than life personality and a taste for cocaine. That's probably why I know him. But arguably, Argentina should never have won the prestigious title that year. In fact, they never should have progressed past their quarterfinal match against England. There was possibly deeper tensions than usual running between the two sides during this quarterfinal match as the UK had only recently quashed an Argentinian invasion of the Falkland Islands in 1982. Well, at least they might be able to beat us at football, because, I mean, <laughs> that Falkland Islands thing, I made a video about it, it's like, holy <laughs> Uh, this controversial 74-day conflict was over two British-dependent territories which had been recognized as a crown colony since 1841, despite Argentina's long-standing claim over the sovereignty of the islands, and despite the fact that they're over 8,000 miles away from the UK. But the big thing about the Falkland Islands, isn't it that everyone lives there, like 99% are like, yeah, but we want to be British or in the UK. I don't want to, this is obviously a controversial political thing. I mean, no one cares, except for, no one cares, no one cares. Do people in Britain? Do they care? Do people in Argentina actually care? Who cares? Um, but don't they want to be British? But if the Argentinians were like, we'll take them, I'll be like, oh, f <laughs> Who cares? Argentinian writer Jorge Luis Borges described the Falklands War as a fight between two bald men over a comb. Yeah, no one cares. <laughs> Thank you. But the UK victory turned out to be good news for then Prime Minister and convicted milk thief Margaret Thatcher. Her popularity was already... Was she a convicted milk thief? I'm, I'm sure this is a reference to a previous thing or a joke or something, wasn't it? I've totally... Her popularity was already in rapid decline towards the end of her first term in office, but the perceived triumph over the Falkland Islands rescued her from oblivion and opened up the doors to another seven years in power. So it was against this bitter political landscape that Argentina and England took to the football pitch in 1986. The first half of the match was a bit rubbish, and the second half saw an amazing goal from Maradona, which some fans dubbed the goal of the century. It's 1986, there's 14 more years yet. I hate it when people are like, already, we're 20 years into the 21st century, and people are like, movie of the century, and it's like, yo, you really don't think we're gonna make any better movies over the next 80 years? No. You smoking crack? Yes! Come to Papa! Look, if it was 2099 or 1999 in 11 months and it came out, you'd be like, this is the best thing of the last 100 years. Yeah, say it. Best thing of the century. There's 80 more f***ing years. However, this was somewhat overshadowed by the other goal that Maradona had scored just four minutes earlier. At first glance, it appeared that Maradona had skillfully headed the ball right past the England goalkeeper Peter Shilton and into the back of the net, but a closer inspection from alternative camera angles soon revealed that Maradona had actually used his hand to push the ball into the net. Holy sh**, you cheeky bastard. But fortunately for Argentina, the Tunisian referee and Bulgarian linesman were caught napping. They apparently looked at each other in confusion, waiting for the other to make the handball call, which neither of them was brave enough to do. The referee would later claim that he was using a treatment for hemorrhoids, which affected his eyesight. Worst case of hemorrhoids I have ever seen! Well, maybe then, mate. You shouldn't be uh, refereeing a World Cup game, should you? You should just take a break. Argentina went on to win the match 2-1 and would ultimately go on to win the World Cup, but it's very possible that they would have never won their match against England if the handball had been spotted. Yeah, but isn't this the whole thing? Like, I thought with football, if the referee doesn't see it, 
or if like the referee doesn't the, it's the referee's call they don't I, and they obviously should they should have like hawkeye in tennis where a player can challenge but in football they don't have that or at least they didn't last time i heard about it so whatever that's how it is Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. Peter Shilton had even argued that Maradona only managed to score the second wonder goal four minutes later because the England team were largely still standing around in shock over the injustice of what had just happened. Well, in that case, guys, you should have just pulled the finger out and carried on with the game because it's called professionalism, chaps. But was this really cheating or just a bad decision by a referee suffering from hemorrhoids and poor vision? It just sounds like a mistake. Unless there's some corruption going on. I mean, Maradona cheated. And maybe he was hoping he wouldn't get caught. Or unless he did it accidentally, I don't know. But either way, it's like the, the referee and the linesman's not in on it. They're just, they're just wrong. Well, Maradona himself was certainly aware of what he'd done. Same page, Danny and I, as always. Shortly after pushing the ball with his hands, he could be seen anxiously glancing sideways at the linesman before diving into a full-on celebration. He's like, ah, ah, ah. Ah, uh, yeah! Woo! He pulls his head over his shirt, he runs around, he does some cocaine. Woo! Daddy, chill. His own former teammate, Jorge Valdano, claims that Maradona regularly practiced the illegal Hamel maneuver during training sessions. Holy sh Maradona. Someone's a bit naughty. And the man himself is not embarrassed to admit that his handball played a part in Argentina winning the World Cup in 1986 at the time he admitted the controversial goal was scored, scored a little with my head. And a little with the hands of God. And by hands of God, he means his hand, tapping it into the goal, you bastard. He also admitted taking pride in the victory over England after the events of the Falklands War, revealing we knew that they had killed a lot of Argentinian boys there, killed them a little, like little birds. And this was revenge. Brilliant revenge. I'm sure Margaret Thatcher was like, oh no. Anyway. Uh, Peter Shilton never forgave Maradona. Even after the Argentinian's hero's death in 2020, Shilton's tribute was laced with bitterness. Never at any stage did he say he had cheated and that he wouldn't say, and that he would like to say sorry. He's the greatest player in history, but I don't respect him as a sportsman, and I never will. Yeah, fair play. I mean, just because he's dead doesn't mean you suddenly have to start respecting him. It's not like after Stalin died, everyone was like, oh, he's dead, we should probably start respecting him. No, they started de-Stalinization. They got rid of all of it. As the man himself, he was later given a 15-month ban from the game after failing a drugs test in 1991. I say he's a cheat twice over, huh? And he spent his later years battling cocaine addiction, obesity, alcohol dependency, paternal lawsuits, and allegations of links with the Camorra Crime Syndicate. Uh oh! <laughs> Gotta get your cocaine from somewhere, though, don't you? Uh, he hit the headlines for the last time of his life in his life in 2018 during a World Cup match between Argentina and Nigeria. Maradona was seen cheering on his home team from the stands, but his behavior was erratic, and there were suspicions, suspicious signs of white powder visible on his wine glass. Seems like he was having a great time. As the camera zoomed in on Maradona, he was seen wildly raising his middle finger to everybody in the stadium, much to the distaste of former England footballer and now TV pundit Gary Lineker, who remarked on the commentary, there's a danger Maradona is becoming a laughingstock, I'm afraid. Sounds like he was a bit of a laughing stock already, wasn't he? We like to think he was just giving the world one last look at the hand of God. Slam dunk. Not a great deal was expected from the Spanish at the 2000 Summer Paralympics held in Sydney. They hadn't even got a team together for the wheelchair basketball event, but they had at least managed to assemble a team for the separate wheelchair ID event, which was reserved for athletes with intellectual disabilities and IQ below the threshold of 70. And what a, ter te uh, blah, blah, blah. And what a team this turned out to be. The Spanish absolutely trounced every team they faced on the court by a minimum of 15 points, and this included an almost embarrassingly comprehensive victory over Japan with a margin of 60 seven points in the score line. Helping with this gold medal winning performance, Spain was set to finish third in the overall medal table just behind the UK and second place, uh, just behind the UK and second place in Australia in pole position. But always not quite as it seemed. One of the members of the Tramva basketball ID team, why is it called a basketball ID team? Like ident- intellectual disability. Ah, uh, ah, uh, sometimes I wonder I should, I'm ID. Uh, was actually an undercover reporter called Carlos Ribagorda, who worked for the business magazine Capital. Carlos sensed a front page, front page scoop when he asked out of the blue if he fancied training with the basketball ID team in Madrid with a view to getting a place on the Paralympian team. Wait, but was he disabled? This is so confusing. There was just one curious point about this. Carlos wasn't, Carlos wasn't mentally impaired in any way, and neither were the vast majority of the team. What? <laughs> that, <laughs> that is so wrong. 
<laughs> it's like the whole point of this was so it's like uh, a fair competition for people who were competing like this and then some guys are like, yeah, yeah. Let's just go beat the shit out of the, the guys who are intellectually disabled. It's like, holy shit. That's a real piece of move right there. After the games had wrapped up, Carlos ran an exposure piece for Capital, which revealed how no less than 10 of the 12 players on the Basketball ID team had no intellectual disabilities of any kind, and how the Spanish Federation for Mentally Handicapped Sports had purposefully sought out non-intellectually impaired individuals to sign up for the team in order to gain a slightly dubious advantage. Slightly dubious advantage. <laughs> he also revealed how he had never been asked to undertake a mental test at any point before hitting the basketball court in Sydney, and alleged that at least five other Spanish Paralympians competing in events such as track and field, swimming, and table tennis had no mental or physical disabilities either, which meant that five of Spain's gold, gold medals had allegedly been won on a fraudulent basis. Wait a second. Even if they'd asked you to take a test, I understand, like, IQ tests, you can't fake high. You go in and you sell the IQ test, it's like, no, nah, no, nah, I faked it. I faked that at an IQ of 180. Whereas, like, if you... If you're just regular smart and you go in and you're like, okay, well, that cube clearly fits into that one. And you're just like, let's try it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that fits in the circle, doesn't it? The cube goes in the circle, right? Right? Guys? Guys? The cube... Uh, and then they'll be like, okay. Because you can cheat down. You can cheat down. You can't cheat up. Apparently, during the first game played by the Spanish Basketball ID team, the coach had briefly gathered the team together and to ask them to move down a few gears to avoid any suspicion that they weren't really disabled. And following the devious gold medal win, they were all told to grow beards and wear hats and dark glasses so that nobody back home in Spain would recognize their triumphant faces when they were hailed as heroes in the national press. I just don't trust anybody like that. Spain, does this really matter? I mean, who gives a Why not just play fairly? I mean, is there some... I feel like with this, it'd be like, yeah, yeah, and the prize was a billion euros. And then you'd be like, okay, sh get it. But it's just the prize is glory that you can't even capitalize on. And if you get caught, you're going to be like a pariah. What are we up to, Spain? What's the, what's the reason? The motivation, well, here we go. The motivation was this, was the billion euro prize. No, I'm just kidding. There the wasn't. There wasn't. It's just a fake gold medal that's actually made out of like 99% silver. Of course it is. The last thing they wanted was for somebody to pick up a newspaper and realize that Professor Sanchez from the University of Barcelona, Barcelona has somehow blagged a spot on the basketball team for the mentally impaired. Danny, I really hope there's not Professor Sanchez at the University of Barcelona. If he's a real dude, we're in trouble. So I'm just going to say allegedly. And not that this, we just, Danny just chose a random Spanish name. Mi nombre es Felipe. Yo voy a la escuela. Felipe. Unless Professor Sanchez was actually a part of this, in which case, f you, Professor. Only the basketball ID team were ultimately ordered to return their gold medals after getting disqualified from the event. And it took 13 years for the Spanish Federation for the Mentally Handicapped Sports to face justice. Although Fernando Martin Vincente had quickly, had swiftly resigned in disgrace, it wasn't until 2013 that he was found guilty of fraud when he was fined $7,300 in order to return almost $200,000, which his federation had received in government subsidies. He was fined $7,300. Well, at least he had lots of time to save up for it, because what a fine. <laughs> I mean, $7,300 is a lot, but this was pretty serious sh Sadly, the scandal also resulted in the removal of events for athletes with learning difficulties for the next two Paralympics, as organizers felt that mental disabilities were too difficult to accurately detect. Yes, I, I agree with that. Um, I also didn't know that ID... Intellectually disabled doesn't feel like it's the PC term anymore. Do people say disabled? I don't think so right? I don't know. It's hard to keep up with. I do try. Um, but also, I, did, I didn't even know that was a thing, to be honest. I thought Paralympics was like, uh, you know, people with kick-ass blade legs. And, and honestly, the guys with the blade legs, they can't compete in the regular Olympics because they're too good, right? They did eventually return to the schedule for London 2012 for just three events, although there's still no sign of a basketball ID event today. And you can't help wondering why Carlos left it until 2000 Paralympics had finished before he ran his exposure story when he knew all along that the Spanish team were cheating. Well, because then it's it's a better story, isn't it? You can tell the whole story from the inside. It's cool. Wouldn't it have been fair all around if it exposed the fraudulent behavior before all those nice shiny gold models had been medals had been wrongly dished out? Yeah, it would have. If he was like an undercover detective for the IOC? I think that the dudes who do the Olympics, but he wasn't. He was a journalist and he wanted the full story. I don't blame him. It's a good story. Skate or die? <clears throat> Where's my coffee? There's one brutally competitive sport which attracts only the toughest of athletes who have the stomach to face up to their rivals with the knowledge that one false move could leave them crushed and left for dead. That sport is figure skating. I mean, yeah, it's pretty intense. They move really fast and that ice is just like rock hard. It's ice. That shit can go wrong. <laughs> Perfect headbutt, man. Oh, 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 
and there's blades everywhere. I mean, that's there's, there's a lot of Olympic sports with blades, blade legs, bladed shoes. Maybe there's sword fighting. The fuck is he talking about? Tonya Harding had become a rising star of figure skating during the early 1990s, winning the US. I feel like I've heard of this cheating. Isn't this the one she had a, uh, like someone got whacked? Like someone got hired a hitman or some shit. Or like to break someone's legs. There was something super intense about figure skating. Winning the US championships in 1991 and going down in history as the first American woman and only the second woman ever to land a triple axle in a competition. That sounds impressive. I wish I knew what it was. But she had later been disappointed to only finish fourth at the 1992 Winter Olympics, one place behind another American rising star, Nancy Kerrigan. I also recognize this one. This is definitely the person who like hired someone to break someone else's legs and like ruin their career or something. It's super intense. Here we go. Who grabbed the bronze medal? I mean, why don't you just read the story? Stop telling us what you think is going to be the story ahead of time because sometimes you're wrong. And also Danny's researched it. I mean, hopefully. Maybe this all just comes off the top of Danny's head, in which case Danny's incredibly gifted. Antonia Sant Trans of qualifying for the US team at the 1994 Olympics were now under serious threat from this promising new rival. Tonya and Nancy couldn't have been more different and clearly grew up on opposite ends of the ice rig. But a bob bob Tonya was seen as a denim clad bad girl who skated to heavy metal and constantly swore in interviews. In contrast, Nancy had something of a squeaky clean image and appeared in commercials for Campbell's Soup. But both both were now chasing the two Olympian spots on the US team for the 1994 Winter Games, which would be determined by the results of the US Figure Skating Championships held earlier the same year. Oh, this is just deeply... F the backstory I mean about the figure skating is just deeply fascinating to me. <laughs> Not. <laughs> Get to the leg breaking, Danny. Daddy, chill. Tonya felt that her chances might be improved if she could gain some sort of competitive advantage over her rival Nancy, who appeared to have stolen glory over the last couple of years. Oh, I tried to turn the page without putting my coffee down. <laughs> Fail. <laughs> oh, I didn't realize it, but I guessed couple. I guessed of years. That was actually on the top of this page. Fascinating fact, boy. Please tell us more about your boring life. But how would you go about gaining competitive advantage in figure skating? Well, here's an idea. You could approach your rival and try to break their kneecaps with a big metal baton so that they were no longer capable of walking. That should do the trick rather nicely. There's a tip. <laughs> what are we doing? It's important to note at this point that Tonya had always denied has always denied to this day any direct involvement with the brutal assault that took place on Nancy Kerrigan following a practice session for the US Championship in Detroit. Nancy had just left the ice rink and was walking alone through a corridor at Kobo Arena when a male assailant jumped out and struck her knee with a 21-inch telescopic bat on before disappearing back into the shadows. Video footage shows the immediate aftermath of the attack with Nancy clutching her knee in pain and repeatedly crying out, why, why, why? Uh, well, you could probably guess why. It's like, oh no, I've been sabotaged, why? Oh wait, then she could be like, why? Maybe that's when the video cameras cut in. Also, why if that was in the film? Why wasn't the attack itself? Oh, it doesn't matter. The answer to Nancy's burning question well, might well be found in the results of the US Championship. Forced to withdraw from the event, Nancy had now seemingly lost any hope for qualifying for the Olympics while Tonya Harding won the championship and secured a spot at the Olympic Games in Lillehammer, Norway. It was later discovered that the attack had been orchestrated by Tonya's ex-husband, Jeff Gillooly, who was clearly still looking after his former partner's interests in collaboration with Tonya's bodyguard. Jeff, it sounds like the other girl needed a bodyguard, to be honest. Like, holy shit. Why does, does a figure skater need a bodyguard? Do people need bodyguards? Like, what's going on? Jeff had hired the uncle and nephew team of Derek Smith and Shane Tant to eliminate Nancy from the competition. Shane Jantz had been the one to strike the blow and to make a panicky escape, which involved headbutting his way through a glass fire escape door before jumping into his uncle's getaway car. However, Jeff later told the authorities that Tonya Harding had been involved in the dastardly scheme from day one. Oh no! Tonya, <laughs> what a surprise! Tonya consistently denied this and claimed that she had only become aware of the plot after the attack had been carried out. Jeff Gillooly, what a, what a name! Jeffster. Tonya's bodyguard and uncle and nephew team were all given relatively light prison sentences of under two years each. Tonya accepted a plea bargain in which she openly pled guilty to conspiracy to hinder prosecution from her failure to pass an information about her ex-husband's plot after she became aware of it. That sounds like... Is she not going to get prison time? But this crime benefited her. It was all for her. And this girl got a ruined knee. I hope she skates again. 
She received three years probation and was fined $100,000 in order to perform 500 hours of community service. That is light. Interesting side point is that when police were digging through Jeff Galuli's garbage, they came across several handwritten notes which outlined the exact schedule and locations uh, location of victim Nancy's practice routines. Handwriting expert later confirmed that the notes had been written by Tonya Harding. How did you not go to prison? You have a great lawyer, Tonya. Here's something to chuck about, though. The whole plot had been a massive waste of time. Although Nancy Kerrigan was clearly hurt from the attack, she suffered only bruising rather than the broken bones or any long-term injury. Legends, And her fellow skaters all agreed that she still deserved the other spot on the US Olympic team. F***ing legends. Nancy went on to win the silver medal whilst Tonya broke down crying mid-performance over a broken shoelace and she could only manage 8th position. Why did she get to compete? F*** that, she should be banned for life. They should take away her blades and refuse to sell her more blades ever again. What a... Insert chose choice of expletive here. You foul and loathe them evil little cockroach! Hermione, no! Following her conviction, Tonya was banned for life from the sport! Yes! Okay, so it just wasn't fast enough. And perhaps became more famous for her honeymoon sex tape than her that her ruthless ex-boyfriend sold to the press in a bitter act of revenge. Wow, you sound like a I mean, wow, like this story's just full of dicks. Much like her sex tape. Don't do it! I'm a virgin. you fuckers watching this sick shit. This is sickening. After a brief stint as a professional boxer and then a welder, Tonya is more likely to be seen these days on Dancing with the Stars and Worst Cooks in America Celebrity Edition. Can we just, uh, like, her being on reality TV is worse than just, is is better than. You could, you'll do, you, you want. What I'm trying to say is can't we just like forget about her and not have her involved with anything because like, that would be a really nice punishment. But it has to be said that Nancy Kerrigan quickly fell from public favor too. Although she won the silver, she had her heart set on gold and wasn't particularly courteous to the surprise 16-year-old Ukrainian winner, Oksana Bayul. Feeling that Oksana was delaying the medal ceremony, Nancy was caught grumpily complaining on camera, oh, come on, so she's going to get out here and cry again. What's the difference? I mean, okay, yeah, not the most sportsman-like thing in the world, but absolutely nothing on what the other women did. Not the winner, the woman who broke her leg. Uh, or bruised her leg, oh my god, who cares. She later decided not to attend the closing ceremony as she had agreed to take part in a charity parade organized by her $2 million sponsors at Disney World, but she could barely make the effort to raise a smile for that $2 million, and a sulky Nancy was again caught on camera, this time muttering into the ear of Mickey Mouse, this is dumb, I hate it, this is the corniest thing I've ever done. Yes, Sam, cue the meme of Jason Statham crying into his money. Nancy was also seen on, last seen on Dancing with the Stars, which seems to have developed into a retirement home for those poor souls eaten up and spat out by the cruelest and most cutthroat sport of them all. And on that note, thank you so much for tuning into this episode of Business. No, no, Brain Blaze, thank you, thank you. And I'll see you next time. Yes. Unless you hated this, then you might never see it again. In which case, that's sad. Bye. Holy shit, Olympics of the past. Today it's like, yes, congratulations to the gold medal winner, blah, 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 bl